Hello, gorgeous. Welcome to HG Radio, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration. Here is your co-founder and host, Kim Becker. Hello, gorgeous. You are listening to Hello, Gorgeous, everything beauty, cancer, and inspiration on Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. I'm your host, Kim Becker, once a hairdresser and a salon owner, now the founder of a nonprofit organization that coaches and trains women with cancer to help them smile when they look in the mirror. And if you ask me, I will tell you that I have the best job in the whole world. This episode is brought to you by Amplified Marketing Group. They specialize in affordable mobile solutions that will get you noticed and help you retain customers. Check them out at www.amplified.marketing. Our guest today is Christina Detman. Christina is an energetic, positively motivated wife, mother, grandmother, and a two-time cancer survivor. She never let cancer slow her down or diminish her positive spirit. Hi, Christina, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi, Kim. You know, I we've got to go back and we kind of have to like share the story. I I I think I have known you for I'm going to say like 14 15 years now, is that correct? Yeah, real close to that. I I think it's been that long. So so when I first met Christina, um she was actually working with my sister and um when you were diagnosed with cancer the first time, um, and I remember it was Super Bowl Sunday, and we were doing the makeovers a little bit different back then. And we had you come into the salon, and um, we gave you a full day of pampering. And I remember you showing up, not quite sure why you were at the salon, and um, we helped you with the wig. And then I remember running into you at Easter time out at a Easter egg hunt, and. Um, and so it's been amazing for me to watch you go through all of the things that you've gone through and still continue to smile. So yep. I am very excited to have you share your story because to me, you, you're an inspiration and women that are going through something very similar need to hear this story and need to hear that there is life after cancer diagnosis and it isn't a death sentence, even when you get it the second time. Um, and so I really, really, really appreciate you being here to share your story. Thank you. So tell me, I want to go back a little bit. Um, tell us about your the, the initial cancer diagnosis. Like, how did you find out that you had breast cancer? In 2008, I was um, taking my husband um, into a hospital for surgery. And my um, nurse from my physician's office called me and told me that there was something in my mammogram. They wanted to do a diagnostic. In that diagnostic, it did show up cancer. Um, they told me it was estrogen progesterone sensitive. Um, it was positive um, for cancer and that I would need to have um, surgery, a lumpectomy, chemo, and then radiation. I went through all of that, and uh, about 10 years later, just under 10 years later, I got cancer again. But in that first round, yes, I met your sister. I've worked with her for many years, and um, she introduced me to you guys, and it was, it was an awesome experience. Um, I'd never had a facial before, and that felt so good. The massage that you gave me, I was in so much pain from my first chemo. That massage just helped my back so much. And it kind of helped relieve the tension and stress that I had, too. Um, but having that makeup and wig put on me, um, just that even though it was a temporary fitting until I lost my hair completely, um, kind of made me feel whole again. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we try and do. But, you know, yours was, you know, your journey, it was atypical, right? Because yes. you tell us about, like, you had a, a reaction to the chemotherapy, correct? Like the first, the first go around. Yep, the first go around. Um, I asked my husband to come with me because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then my other friend, Kim, was there also, and 
I'm glad she was there because my husband left to get us some lunch because we were hungry. He just walked across the street to McDonald's. And in that time frame, they went ahead and the nurse was ready to start my chemo. Well, one thing that she had said to me was, make sure you tell me if you feel anything strange at all. Well, I didn't think I was feeling anything strange. Felt like my stomach was growling. I was hungry. It was time to eat lunch. And come to find out, um, after a few more minutes, Kim come over. She seen me. She come over and she checked on me. And I said, um, I'm feeling weird, but I think it's just my stomach because I'm hungry. And somebody had called her away. So she walked over to another patient. And then um, she had looked back at me and I was starting to turn red. At the time, I could not breathe at all. I turned beet red. Um, she was calling the nurses. The nurses were calling other nurses stat. Um, they were trying to get oxygen on me. Um, it was a severe reaction to the chemo drug. Um, and I had never had allergies before, so nobody even knew that I was allergic to the chemo drug. Um, so, yeah, it was it was very, very scary. And my husband made it back in time after everything ended. <laughs> but it took several hours for them to pump that medication into me um, because there was no other alternative for me. I, I had to have that drug. Wow. I can't imagine. I mean, what are your thoughts now? Like when you look back on that, like you're here, like you're here and you were as scary as that was, you, you made it through that. When you sit back and you relive that first chemotherapy, what goes through your mind? I still get goosebumps. I have them right now talking to you about it. Um, it, it, it was very scary. Um, and now um, that I've had to go through another bout of chemo, I, I, I look at it and I sit there and I think, am I going to have a reaction to this drug? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to me this time? That's what goes through my mind, having it again. But even if I hadn't had it again, my thought was, I made it through. I'm alive. That's right. I'm I'm re I'm ready to go and live my life. <laughs> That's right. So tell me. So fast forward. Then you went through the first time. You went through all the chemo, the radiation. You were in remission. And then what sparked the second diagnosis? Was it in the other breast? Was it something they found on a mammogram? How did you How did you come about that? In the fall of 2017, I had been out in the garden, and I was um, pulling weeds and, and just cleaning up all my flower beds around the house. And it was getting late, so I knew I needed to come in and make some dinner. I did that. Um, but standing at the counter, I felt like a sting. And I was like, well, what is that? Do I got a bug in my shirt? You know, that's what I was thinking. And I flipped my shirt off, and there was no bug, but I did have a puncture. I had a red mark. So I knew that there had been something in my shirt, at least I thought. And that wasn't the case. Within the next four or five months um, from that October, um, I finally decided to talk to my husband about it. And it had protruded. It had gotten bigger, and it had protruded. And I told him, you know, I'd just been kind of keeping an eye on it. And he said, no, I think you need to go see a doctor. So I actually played around and waited another couple of months and finally went into the doctor in April. They sent me to a, um, I went to the Kelly, uh, Brian and Pocky Kellen, Kelly um, Mammogram Center. And um, they did the diagnostic. They found nothing. They got the results back at my physician's office, and he said, I don't like it. I want you, I'm going to set you an appointment up to go see your surgeon that did your lumpectomy. And I said, okay. Well, I went in, and I seen Dr. Thomas, and the minute he seen it, he had already told the nurse, get this, 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 and this. He, as I, I put it, he dissected me right on the table. Wow. Something wrong. Wow. And I 
to this day, I am so thankful for him um, for trying to get as much out of me as possible. But that cancer um, that they took out of me came back to me as angiosarcoma. Okay. I didn't know what that was. Um, I had gone in to see Dr. Zahn again. She turned around and told me all the information. It's a, it's very rare cancer, and it is caused from the radiation treatment that I had from my first cancer. Wow. So then what goes through my mind is, did I get too much radiation? Is that why I got this cancer? Because, sure. yeah, they tell you radiation can cause cancer, but this was a treatment plan that the radiologist and the oncologist set up together. So now I'm thinking, how many other women are getting more cancer treatments than they should be getting? Right. It's scary. It's scary. The unknown is very scary. Well, and you're caught between a rock and a hard place, right? Because if you don't follow yep. everything that the doctors tell you to do and it comes back, then they say, well, you didn't follow everything that we told you to do. But then if you do do everything that they tell you, and you know what I mean? It, you just have to ask, which is the lesser of two evils? And and I think you did the right thing because you were able to be cancer free for 10 years. So almost 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, yep. I I don't think that you didn't do the right thing, but I'm sure that there are a ton of questions that go through your head during that time. There is. And there, there are people that ask you, you know, you should go get a second opinion. Um, do you want to go get a second opinion? I think you should go get a second opinion. And, you know, I did have friends and family tell me that I should do that. But what really amazed me the most was when Dr. Zahn said, if you would like a second opinion, I would be more than happy if you did that. It would not bother me at all. I've never done that before. I've never come across a doctor to where I've had to think back, okay, this is a very scary situation now. This is a rare disease. It's in my blood vessels. How are we going to proceed with this? Well, her procedure thought was, there's two different ways to go, and she wanted to um, converse with IU Bloomington doctors. She's got some doctors down there that deal with this a little bit more than she has. I was her only second patient wow. that had had this. Wow. And she said, um, we're either going to hit it hard and you're going to be hospitalized for two weeks, or what I want to do because of your reaction to the chemo drugs I want to keep you here and put you on a regimen with two different drugs. So they did. They talked about it. They had their meeting, and I didn't have to go down to Indianapolis for anything. I got to stay here under her regimen. And now um, I am a year and a half free. I am uh, having x-rays every six months and seeing her every six months. Because she said if it comes back, it will come back in my lung. Okay. So, so they're checking. They're keeping an eye on you, though. They're watching me very close, yeah, because this, this is an extremely rare and deadly disease to top it off. Wow. So yeah. what advice do you give to someone who has had cancer before and then facing it like another diagnosis years later? Like what advice do you give somebody that's in that circumstance? Listening back to everybody telling me to get a second opinion, I know I would have probably done that this time. And that's, that's one big thing I think I would tell somebody. You've got one opinion, get a second opinion. Um, it doesn't hurt it. The doctors don't mind at all. Because um, eventually what's going to happen is if that doctor advises you to get a second opinion like I was advised, um, do it. Because nine times out of ten, you're going to end up with her anyway because you trusted her right. from getting that second opinion. Right. Um, and ask how, a lot of questions. Well, and so that's just it. Like, what? how do you talk to a doctor and what kind of questions do you recommend that people actually ask the doctor? Because I.